Today, we'll explore how I upgraded my LAN from single gigabit to both 10 gigabit and 25 gigabit connections, including the use of fiber optics. From network cards to transceivers to cables, I'll show you everything you need to know to set up and connect machines at multi-gigabit speeds before we measure and test the performance in both real-world and synthetic tests. It's everything you need to know to achieve some truly blistering network speeds, all right here today from Dave's Garage. Do it live! I can all write it and we'll do it live! Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. Today in Dave's Garage, I've upped the ante on my home lab network by stepping up to a mix of 10 and 25 gigabit network speeds. With regular Ethernet LANs turning in a single gigabit, the jump to 10 gigabits is huge, a full order of magnitude faster. And going to 25 gigabits is that much again and then some more. Before we're done, we'll achieve SSD speeds from our network storage, whether connected by a laptop or desktop. We're going to start our adventures in multi-gigabit networking by answering two of the most basic and fundamental questions you likely have. What are the various ways that you can interconnect two computers together at 10 or 25 gigabits? And why would you do so? Are the benefits worth the cost and effort? First, I'll show you how to connect both with and without a switch. And I'll show you how to do it using direct attached copper cables. That's these fancy patch units right here that look like they should be really expensive but aren't bad at all, as well as fiber optics and with good old RJ45 twisted pair cable. And finally, we'll actually run some real-world speed tests between computers to see what the connection can truly do. Can it really send 25 gigabits of data each and every second, or is that more marketing than reality? We'll find out for certain in our tests. To get started, let's have a look at the cables and connection types. First, we'll look at how you can interconnect your equipment by RJ45, direct copper, and fiber optic. Everything I show you here applies equally to both 10 and 25 gigabits, as long as the parts you're using are rated for that speed. We'll talk more about the differences once we cover the basics. Let's say the PCs are represented by these two network cards. Because they're SFP+, all we need now is a direct attached copper cable, like so. We simply plug one into one PC, plug the other end into the other PC, and instant 10 gigabit connection. Good to go. Now to release one of these SFP connections, here's a little tab here, and we need to pull on that. Helps if you push in on the cable at the same time, and they slide on out easily. Now, this is all well and good if your PCs are within the same room or somewhere that you can easily run this DAC cable. However, if you're going to run longer runs, you probably want to consider fiber. Now, to connect the fiber cable to the port, you of course need the fiber optic transceiver. This little giga here is for releasing and pulling out the SFP adapter, but it also retains and holds in the plastic cable housing. So, once we insert it like this, and the other side like so, we can simply insert it as if it were a pre-made cable. There you go, your first super exotic fiber optic connection, up and running. Well, if it were powered and plugged into something. Now to remove these, you've got to push down on the plastic tab. Let me uh, do the other one, I'll turn it sideways so you can see better. That releases it, and then to slide out the transceiver, pull down the giga, and yank out the transceiver. And surprising fact, the retention clip really is called a Giga. You can look that up on Wikipedia. Impress your friends. Tell someone now. Now, unlike the DAC cables, Twisted Pair is not wired with a crossover. So we're going to use this little module, which flips, receive, and transmit. And that will give us the ability to connect one directly to the other without a switch. So we simply insert the two transceivers. Plug the RJ45 cables into the transceivers. And then each one into the coupler. And this special coupler is what contains the crossover circuit that flips the receive and transmit. And there you go, two PCs connected to 10 gigabits by twisted pair. But this contraption with the crossover module is more complicated than it needs to be because you can buy Ethernet cables that have the crossover built in. This fancy yellow one is such a crossover. So, the simplest one yet, two cards, one cable, and a lot less messy. To remove the transceivers, we first need to remove the cable and then we flip down the little retention bar. We can then pull the transceiver out of the card. Now, if these had been RJ45 cards in the first place, we wouldn't have needed the transceivers, and it would just be the cable in that case. Now, what if you wanted to connect three PCs? You're probably thinking, eh, it's time for a switch. But not necessarily. With simply two cables, as long as one of them is in fact a dual port card, you can, through software routing, simply wire them like this. Watch me bend this cable 
in the wrong direction in order to show you how not to do things. This is purely instructive, not a mistake on my part. Now, if your situation gets any more complicated, you pretty much have to resort to using a switch. So let's remove this center guy and replace him with a micro tick switch. Now, in all these direct connect scenarios, we've assumed that you're getting your internet through some other means, like the other original onboard single gigabit NIC. But if that's not the case and you want to supply it through the single 10 gigabit connection, then the switch allows you to have an uplink port, which you can tie back into your existing LAN WAN setup. And this port is only a single gigabit, so it doesn't matter what you plug it into, it's one gig. Now let's assume the more realistic case where one of these PCs is further away and needs to be connected through some other means like fiber. So let's get rid of the direct attached copper on this one side and we'll replace it with a fiber link. Now while an RJ45 cable with a transceiver would be limited to 30 meters and a native port would be 100 meters, fiber of the OM3 variety will run up to 300 meters. These transceivers are actually rated for 300 meters as well, so it's not purely theoretical. In fact, all you need to do is use a longer cable. So why don't we try that? We'll remove this uh, short cable and slam down this big spool of 75 meters. Now remember, you can go four times this. This gives you a pretty good representation of a scenario where you've got a server room with one computer connected by direct attached copper, the switch, and then a remote computer connected by fiber. And here's the module you need to pass it through one of those little Leviton wall plates and make a fiber connection in the room tidy. Now I'll reconnect it as though we're going into a wall plate in a room. We'll use this as the in-room cable and the long one as the in-wall cable. They connect via the module that goes into the wall plate. Now there's a 50-50 shot that I've got this module backwards because I didn't actually look. I'm a busy man. And like Bill O'Reilly on Inside Edition, we're doing it live. Do it live! I can, I'll write it and we'll do it live! There we have our little model of a server room and a remote PC connected by a fiber through a wall plate. Getting its internet through an RJ45 connection back to the home LAN. And I've just complicated it a little further by adding a 10 gigabit RJ45 connection. Now some would be content, some would stop there, but not me, especially when I'm working off camera, I'm extremely bold, so let's add yet another client here. We'll put back in this dual NIC and we'll use one of his ports to connect back to the switch. As another cautionary example for your educational benefit, I'm going to wire it in a way that triggers people. What do you think of that? Does that bother you? Bothers me. Let me fix that. What I find fascinating is that some percentage of the population will be like, huh? What? What did it even change? And others will be like, oh, thank goodness. Now that I see this, it's going to make one dandy thumbnail. This configuration would actually work pretty well for a small video studio where you have two editors that need 10 gig access to, say, a network attached storage that is also at 10 gig. And because the switch is SFP, we've done most everything else in SFP for economical reasons. I need to get more specific about RJ45 twisted pair cables by explaining the category levels such as CAT5, CAT6, and CAT7. It's quite possible that you've never done any networking outside of twisted pair Ethernet cables since it debuted for Ethernet way back in 1984. When I was an intern in college, I spent the summer swapping out old Ungerman Bass UB net cards. They used a weird 15-pin setup that had what looked like a game port connector on it. Occasionally, you might find coaxial Ethernet back then or even a token ring setup, but that was the last networking I saw that didn't use familiar old RJ45 twisted pair. As a pedantic aside about shielding so that you can annoy your friends at nerdy cocktail parties, when a network cable has the shielding inside, the connector on the end is actually called an RJ48, not an RJ45. Now, they look the same to me, but I'm guessing one supports crimping and connection of the shielding ground. Similarly, the old UTP acronym referred to unshielded twisted pair cable, but now that some of it all has shielding anyway, I'm just going to call it twisted pair. There are really three primary types of twisted pair cables that you need to be concerned with. CAD5E, CAT6, and 6A. Those are the names for the major categories of cables available. The main differences between those categories of cables are their performance characteristics, including speed. CAT5E supports up to 1 gigabit, while CAT6 supports speeds of up to 10 gigabit for shorter runs, and 6A supports speeds of up to 10 gigabits over longer distances. In terms of distance, CAT5E and CAT6 cables have a maximum distance of 100 meters at 1 gigabit, while CAT6A cables can support up to 100 meters at 10 gigabit speeds. 
I've got runs of 50 meters of plain Cat 6, which isn't guaranteed to work, but seems to for me. Noise immunity. Cat 6A has more noise immunity compared to Cat 5E and Cat 6, making it suitable for environments with high electromagnetic interference. Cost. Cat 6A cables are typically more expensive than Cat 5E and Cat 6 cables due to their higher performance capabilities and more complicated internal construction. And pain. Due to all the extra shielding, Cat 6A cables are much more annoying to hand terminate. I'd suggest that if you don't need the distance, you stick with Cat 6 when hand terminating if you can. You might also see mention of Cat 7, which is basically just Cat 6 with better shielding, and Cat 8, which is rated for 40 gigabits, but they're not very common yet. While I'm at it, you might have noticed that I used a special crossover coupler in the earlier cable segment, but the reality is that most every gigabit and faster port can be direct wired and it'll sort out any crossover requirement automatically. So while they're not incorrect, they're not strictly necessary for most modern connections. The other type of port we saw in that segment was the SFP port. There are actually three different SFP ports that you'll run into that look completely the same physically. Those are the SFP, the SFP Plus, and the SFP 28. Respectively, those are the 1 gig, 10 gig, and 25 gig standards for the transceivers. They're all the same form factor, so in principle you could hot swap to and from the same switch port as long as the port supports that speed. The difference between them is often impossible to distinguish without actually reading the label. There are also different brand standards scattered in there like Cisco and Mellanox. I've had good luck with and have standardized on using the Mellanox style SFP28 transceivers from 10G Tech on Amazon, and I've put links to all the networking hardware that you'll see here today in the video description. As you saw, these ports accept three different types of cables, optical, twisted pair, and direct attached copper. The transceiver ends determine the speed with which the cable will attempt to operate, and of course, you're limited to the speed of the switch or the network card at the other end of the connection as well. So far, I've had reasonably good luck with auto-negotiation of speeds when mixing and matching speeds at the switch. A 25 gigabit transceiver plugged into a 10 gigabit port should negotiate and run down at 10, but your mileage may vary. Similarly, a 10 gigabit transceiver should work in a 25 gigabit port at the 10 gigabit speed. What if you wanted to go longer than the typical 5 or 10 meter run? Or what if you already had CAT6 or better cable in the wall, or even a short run somewhere of CAT5e? then probably the easiest thing to do would to be use RJ45 transceivers and twisted pair cable. That will get you out to about 30 meters or 100 feet. If you want to go longer than 30 meters with twisted pair, the cable quality becomes even more important, and you can no longer use simple transceivers. You'll need to use fully native RJ45 ports rated for 100 meters. As far as I can tell, that's because pushing 100 meters over twisted pair would require more power than is available at the SFP port. That means you wouldn't be able to use a cheap 4-port Microtik SFP switch, so you're back to a direct connection between computers, and those computers would need to have RJ45 LAN ports, not SFP ports with RJ45 transceivers. You can mix and match cable styles. You could have an SFP Plus cable running a short distance within a server closet, for example, and a longer twisted pair run connected via RJ45. That could go to a transceiver port if it's 30 meters or less, or to a native RJ45 port for up to 100 meters. In my shop, I run two switches. First, there's a Netgear switch with two 10 gig ports and eight 1 gig ports. I connect one of the native RJ45 10 gig ports back to the data rack and one on to a 25 gigabit QNAP switch. The second switch features a single 10 gigabit downlink connection and then 16 25 gigabit SFP28 ports. Those ports are used to connect to my Mac Ultra Studio, my Storinator server in the closet, and my desktop Threadripper PC. Thus, they can intercommunicate at 25 gigabits amongst themselves and then at 10 gigabits to the rest of the entire LAN. My Synology NAS is connected at 10 gigabits and I do my video editing directly on it. Soon, however, I'll transition to working directly on the Storinator, which is connected at 25 gigabits. I'm pretty happy with the QNAP switch now that it's running right, but I had a bit of an adventure trying to get it going. Setting it up the day it got here from Amazon, as soon as I plugged in one of the SFP Plus cables, it tripped the GFCI circuit breaker in the shop which is all the stranger given it was even plugged in through a UPS as well. I monkeyed around with it for quite a while trying to figure it out, and pretty soon it would pop the breaker just as soon as I plugged the power cable even in, even with all the ports empty. Confused, I tried it on a second circuit, and it popped the breaker on that one too. So I took it into the house to try it on an otherwise unloaded bathroom GFCI circuit when I noticed a rattle coming from the case when I walked. And that's when I noticed the top cover wasn't even attached. And that's because at least one of the screws was rattling around inside the machine. Apparently the screw was rolling around in the power supply section and it created a dead short. At least I knew the cause of the circuit popping now, but I can't explain the unattached top. 
I bought it new on Amazon, and it seemed to still be in the heavy factory-sealed shrink wrap. I never did find the second screw, though, which bugs me enough that I might request an exchange on it. Not that I need the screw, but in case it's somewhere wedged in between the board and the case that I can't see, waiting to cause problems later. In any event, with the rogue fastener removed and the case held on with the one screw, it works exceptionally well. I guess it's technically a managed switch, but I've never bothered. It's plug-and-play as a dumb switch, as far as I can tell, and that's how I'm using it. Adding 25 gigabit networking to the Storinator and to the desktop Threadripper was incredibly cheap and easy. First, I grabbed a pair of Mellanox Connect X4 cards from eBay at around $100 each. Each features two ports, but I'm using only one on each machine, and they connect the 25 gigabit fiber connection back to the switch. Windows and Linux both contain drivers for the Mellanox in the box. Well, out of the box. The Mac Studio Ultra was a little more challenging. It comes with a 10 gigabit networking port, but there's no way to get an internal 25 gigabit card. I considered adding another external Thunderbolt cage into which I could install that same style of Mellanox card, but I wasn't sure about the driver support on the M1 Mac. My search instead led me to the Addo Thunderlake 3 external 25 gigabit adapter. It connects by Thunderbolt cable and provides two 25 gigabit SFP28 ports. It also features a second Thunderbolt port so that you can daisy chain devices off it and thus you don't lose use of the port. The only downside, and it's a minor concession, is that technically there's only 25 gigabits of bandwidth available on a Thunderbolt connection because it saves space for video. So you're limited to 22 gigabits, not 25. I doubt you'd be ever able to tell, however, except maybe in synthetic benchmarks like iPerf. Rest assured, we will test it today. In terms of interconnect, I did all of the 25 gigabit cabling as fiber. If you don't have native RJ45 ports, or if you're near or beyond the 100 meter mark, or if you need to run new cable anyway, it's likely a good time to start looking at fiber optic. Now, if you're anything like me, fiber optic seems somehow fascinating, even exotic. You may have a rough idea how it works, but not the slightest idea of what you'd actually have to purchase to make any of it work together. Well, it's time to relax, because like the piano teacher who stays exactly one chapter ahead of her students, I've already researched it for you. Rather than throw a bunch of multi-mode and single-mode fiber terminology out at you, let's look at some of the basics. In a fiber optic cable, there are two ways to send light down it. You can send a single beam of light down it carefully centered and as carefully aligned as possible using a single beam of light from a laser. That's single mode. There's a single beam of light at a single angle, hence single mode. The problem is that you need the laser and some very careful alignment, which in turn drives up the cost and complexity. Alternatively, you can just light the whole glass core up with a big old LED, which shines in multiple angles and modes. Flash that LED off and on and send your binary data. That's multiple mode. Normally, we're conditioned to think that multiple of something is better than single, but when it comes to fiber optics, think about precision and selectivity. It's that single-mode laser that makes all the difference. The cable core is made exceptionally tiny, like one-fifth that of a human hair, and the laser is carefully aligned. We're more worried about signal loss than speed, of course, but the fewer bounces within the cable, the better. And if you think about it, the skinnier the core, the less time the light spends going back and forth, and the more time the light spends going that away, and hence fewer bounces and less loss. Multimode fiber, that we'll be using, has a much thicker core. You can blast LED light in one end and it comes out the other. It's not well aimed or aligned at all, but it'll carry your cheap signal for a few hundred meters. But that's a big difference from the single-mode, high-precision laser stuff which can go for miles on a single run. So as I said, guess which one we'll be using? That's right, the cheap and easy multi-mode stuff made for data centers, not the fancy and complicated laser stuff intended for telecom providers. The little optical transceivers convert the electrical signals at the SFP port and send them down the tube in the form of light pulses. A sensor in the transceiver's input port receives it and converts it back into an electrical signal at the SFP port on the other end, and you're all set. The only parts you need are the transceivers and the multi-mode fiber cable. From there, you can plug it into any SFP Plus or SFP28 switch. To buy cable, you need to know what speed you're running, which in our case is going to be 25 gigabits. There are at least four grades of optical cable. OM1 for 1 gigabit, OM2 for 2.5 gigabits, and OM3 for 10 gigabits. OM4 takes you up to 40 gigabits, and since I'll be running 25, that's what I've opted to use. And here's an important safety tip. You should never look into the end of a fiber optic cable to see if it's working, and never point at it at animals or people. The light can have enough energy in the infrared spectrum to burn little spots into your retina, and they can be permanent, so be careful. Fiber cables are identified by color. OM1, which is for old and slow speeds like 100 megabit, is normally orange in color. At my old office about a mile from here, I used to have an orange OM1 cable that brought in 45 megabit internet for thousands of dollars every month. 
You often saw that old orange fiber cable in the telecom closets of office buildings and so on. OM2 cable is also usually orange or less commonly brown, but still not fast enough for our needs. We need at least OM3 cable for 10 gigabits, which is blue, like this. But in order to have enough bandwidth for 25 gigabits, I'll need OM4, which is good for 40 gigabits. It's pink or blue, which means not all blue cable is the same. It could be OM3 or OM4. As for range, a quick and easy mnemonic that even I can remember is that OM3 is good for 300 meters and OM4 is good for 400 meters. Now, I hate calling anything future-proof, but if you go with OM4 or better, it can actually handle up to 100 gigabits for up to 100 meters. No promises, of course, but if your in-wall cabling is good to 100 gigabits, I'd say you should be set for a while. Remember that no matter what the cable type that connects them, they all terminate in an SFP Plus or SFP28 module for plugging into the switch. The switch itself doesn't know or care how the bits were actually transported to the transceiver because all it can see is the transceiver itself. It could be backed by copper, or it could be glass, or microwave beam, or carrier pigeon. As long as it carries the information from one port to the other without air and at the prescribed rate, that's all that matters. Let's take a quick look at my own server closet where we can see all three types of connections being actively used. Obviously, RJ45 twisted pair cables form the bulk of the wiring. We'll talk in more detail about the various subtypes later, but for now, just know that my general color coding is that blue is regular old gigabit, red carries power over Ethernet off to switches and access points and cameras that need it, and yellow is 10 gigabit. These black cables that you see are the direct attached copper cables plugged directly into the SFP or SFP plus ports, and the single aqua cable, or blue, is OM3 fiber optic. That single fiber connection is the main connection from my unified Dream Machine Pro down to the internet router and aggregation switch. It's an OM3 fiber run with transceivers on either end. It could just as easily be a direct attached copper cable, but in this case, my equipment is electrically isolated from the service provider for whatever that's worth. And somehow it's just satisfying to me to know that the main incoming internet connection to my house is fiber for some reason. The 10 gig cables from the Dream Machine Pro connect to the 10 gig aggregation switch. Various other 10 gig drop points throughout the house are connected at 10 gig here as well. The vast majority of the other ports in the house are on a separate 48 port Unify switch. Between the top switches is a PoE switch that sends power and data to things like access points and cameras, as I mentioned, that are powered by the Ethernet cable itself. It's finally time to take a quick look at some benchmarks in order to see how closely we can approach the theoretical 25 gigabit limit. First, we'll try it against my Storinator NAS, which features a Samsung 980 Pro as a cache drive, so it should be able to supply all the data the client wants. Let's find out. Let's try it from the Storinator back to the PC. As you can see, it stabilizes at a maximum of 23.5 gigabits, which is dangerously close to the maximum speed predicted. There's always going to be some amount of overhead, so I think that's a pretty fine result. The Mac was a bit more confounding. For reasons I don't fully understand yet, the connection from the Mac when operating and reading from the Storinator seems to be limited to about 12 gigabits a second. The read case, however, peaks at over 20 gigabits, very close to the hardware limit of 22. On the PC side, when running against a RAM disk on the Storinator, Crystal Disk Mark reports a peak read speed of 2,850 megabytes per second. Oddly, that's slightly more than 25 gigabits of raw throughput, but that's the number it gives me. Since it seems data is flowing well in most cases, let's try a disk benchmark. For these tests, it's physically reading to and from an SSD on the other end, so it's capped by the disk I.O. speed as well. The Mac Ultra manages a maximum write speed of between 700 and 900 megabytes a second, something it could have done with just a 10 gigabit connection. But it's able to take great advantage of the read speeds, peaking at almost 1900 megabytes per second. Those are SSD speeds over the network, which would be perfect for my purposes. That makes the Auto Thunderlink 3 almost 20 times as fast as a conventional LAN connection. If you feel the need for that kind of speed, it's a great option. And that leads us to the other introductory question I asked, can you make any use of it? I think the answer really depends on whether you're working with large files that need high transfer rates. In my case, I edit a lot of 4K video for this channel, and not only does the editing demand about 4 gigabits for smooth operation, but the resulting files are huge, ranging into several terabytes. When it's time to copy them or back those files up, that's about the only thing you can use to see the real advantage of 25 gigabit. In summary then, if you're doing video editing and want to do it against a NAS or a remote server, then I think 10 gigabit is a much needed and worthy investment. For now though, the use cases for 25 gigabits, at least for a single user, are less common. If you have the setup that demands that, however, both the Mellanox on the PC and the Auto Thunderlink 3 on the Mac appear more than up to the task. If you have any interest in matters related to autism, Asperger's, or ASD, please check out the free book sample on Amazon for Secrets of the Autistic Millionaire. 
It's everything I know now about autism and Asperger's that I wish I'd known back then. It's not just for people who are or believe they might be on the spectrum, but for also anyone who lives with, loves, or works with someone who might be. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. Remember, I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so please be sure to leave me one of each before you go today. In the meantime and in between time, I'll see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.